All right, so welcome everyone to the Equal Rights Commission um, public hearing in regards to housing. Uh, we are hosting a series of public hearings to hear from the public um, and also local organizations that are working in that realm of um, housing. And so the first um, meeting, we the first public hearing, we invited um, Freedom House, New Cap, and then um, House of Hope to come speak. So that was virtual and that was recorded. So if um, you do want to go back and look at that, you can. Um, that was back in February. Um, so this is our second public meeting. And today we'll have Komsa. Um, so Commissioner uh, Hassan would be speaking on behalf and then his colleague. And then we have Golden House. Um, Amanda is her name. She's running a little late. And then, of course, we have the Howe Community Resource Center, the Executive Director, Amanda. And um, I wanted to, um, oh, before we get started, sorry, I have to take a roll call, huh? Yeah, you take a roll call. Yeah. And then one thing, do you mind so the, door? the door? Yeah, I just say oh, yeah. the door. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, so um, when I call your name, please say um, I or here. Commissioner Shelton? Here. Commissioner Vinson? Here. Commissioner Hassan? Yeah. All right, and the excused ones are um, Commissioner Marcus Rigno, um, Commissioner Christine Ortiz, Commissioner Elizabeth Kashtika, um, Commissioner Verona, Veronica Corpus Dex, and Commissioner Isaac Kavashinsky. All right, um, so. Going back to what I was saying, um, we are lucky to have collaborated today with the Howe Community Research Center to utilize their space and uh, for this, for our first official, I guess, our first in-person meeting with m the, mo the most commissioners that we've had for an in-person meeting. So um, thank you so much, Amanda, for allowing us to use this space. Um, and I wanted to um, go around and have the commissioners just quickly introduce your names and your affiliation. And then, uh, so just so Amanda kind of understands who we are, and then we, um, I'll have Amanda introduce herself and her organization. So I guess I'll go first. So my name is uh, Tara Ying, and I, I serve as the chair for the Equal Rights Commission, and I am a small business owner here. Uh, John Shelton, I'm the vice chair, and I am a faculty member at University of Wisconsin Green Bay. Michael Benson, I uh, professionally work at Trevor Foods. Saeed Hassan, I, work, I am the co-founder and executive director of Community Services. Nice to Okay, and then Amanda, if you don't mind um, introducing yourself and your organization. Yeah, so um, my name is Amanda Johnson. I'm the executive director here at the Howe Community Resource Center. Um, and I was actually honored because Cheryl was on the board here many years ago, and so it was really cool to kind of come full circle and allow be able to have a board member seat. So the Howe Community Resource Center our mission is to ensure that all families are safe, healthy, and ready for academic and life success. We truly believe that children um, are, we need to obviously be there for the children, but they don't operate in isolation. Um, there are families with children and they need to be supported just as much. We work um, with, directly with House School, which is right behind us. Uh, that's one of the legs of our program. House School is approximately, at last count, 94.3% of the students that attend House School are experiencing poverty, either at or below the level. And so while that doesn't always mean there are barriers and that there are issues, there, there sometimes are. And so we wrap around the school as a community school effort. Uh, we are the only, there, Aldo is a community school, but as far as the, the definition that we use for a community school, we're a neighborhood hub that wraps around the school to address everything from basic needs, academic support, extended learning opportunities. Some of the things we do is uh, we fund a snack program so that all help students can have a snack every day so that some of those kids eat at 10 a.m. and by 1 o'clock they're bouncing um, off the walls. Um, and just need kind of a, a regulation. And so we provide 7,000 snacks a month to house school. Um, and we hope in the future to be able to extend some of those services out to the other schools that are considered um, needing a little bit more support. Um, we also fund an attendance bus. Uh, about 100 kids from house school were habitually late or not here at all for school. And obviously if they're not at school, they're not going to be doing well on tests and things like that. So we fund an attendance bus that goes to 16 uh, set stops um, in this general area, and it goes and it picks up those kiddos, and shockingly or not shockingly, attendance rates increased, tardiness decreased, and right before COVID, 
um, test scores, obvious, uh, we're actually also showing some major improvement. Um, and then we do a wide variety of other things with how school they are, um, really why we're here, which is why you have mm -hmm. how school in the name. But our work with how school has also helped us extend out to other schools. I have an assistance fund that helps the nine other uh, schools in Green Bay that are considered at risk. I don't like to use that word, but it's the word that the EPI uses. So we have um, a significant assistance fund that, we, that helps everything from the evictions to basic needs. Um, a, a mom just got a job as a CNA, didn't have scrubs for her job, so we were able to finance and get those scrubs for her. Those are just some of the things that we do. We also have a hygiene hub in the back that um, started as uh, during COVID, just like every nonprofit in the world. We had to activate and do what we could. Didn't really matter where our, what our missions were at that point. It was just about getting things in the hands of families. So we had two hygiene handouts where we passed out eight to 800 families hygiene items. We know that pre-COVID that was still, that was an issue. Post-COVID, it's still going to be an issue. Families can't use food share on uh, hygiene items. So we have a hygiene hub in the back that's accessible to all Brown County school social workers, so not just Green Bay school, so so school social workers, as well as other small agencies can access that. In addition to our work with House School, we have an intensive home visitation program that works for prevention. We're trying to um, walk alongside families and recognize that there are a lot of barriers that exist for families and we help to address those barriers and so we have an intensive home visitation program that goes into the home at least twice a month with families and sits and works with them in their parenting journey. We also have, um, we are very proud to announce that we, um, we waited, that we weren't going to wait anymore for uh, the school to get, a, to get how a mental health professional, so we made one ourselves. So we have a, a full-time mental health professional who um, is right now working with house scholars as well as some of our home visitation families. The waiting list for mental health for kids right now is about six to 12 months. Um, and, and then even when you get on that waiting list um, and you get an appointment, it's often hard for families to leave in the middle of the day to take their kids to mental health appointments. So similar to the oral health partnership, which is the free dental care on site, we have free mental health care on site. So Holly has a caseload of scholars that walk right across the little alley. Um, they get taken out of non-academic time, so we have that scheduled so that they're not missing their important academics and they have their mental health needs addressed. We also go wrap around the family because oftentimes, again, child doesn't operate in isolation. And then we have a partnership with House of Hope. We provide their parenting classes right now so that they don't have to fund those somewhere else. And we have other partnerships uh, with other agencies as well. So thank you very much for coming. Um, if you'd like a tour after, it's really quick. Uh, but it is pretty impactful, and I can share it a little bit more. So thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Yes, thank you. All right. Um, so since um, we just did introductions, we're going to move on um, to the normal procession of things. Um, so uh, do, would I have to do the motions to approve minutes and things like that? Or no, no we'll, not to today. we'll just move to informational. Okay, so we're going to skip down to informational, and that is uh, where we invite our guest speakers to speak. So do you guys want to move a little closer, or do you guys feel comfortable there? I will be standing. Uh, so thank you, Amanda, for Ooh. I'll use the opportunity to stand and move a little bit. I've been sitting the whole Okay. <laughs> so my name is Sayyid Hassan. I I am the co-founder and the executive director, as I said earlier. Uh, it was a privilege for me to be in this community. Uh, born in Somalia during the Civil War, lived in so many countries, ended up in Green Bay. So I can I consider myself as a lucky one, surviving through that. You know, considering the time I was growing up and what happened during that time and having reflection of where those age mates, you know, age mates, my age mates are. Luckily now we could, uh, some of them meet virtually. Facebook is just creating a lot of uh, people whom I thought they, were, they died a long time ago are now communicating with me. So um, <clears throat> it's just that under precarious condition I lived. Coming to Green Bay and living in this country was another additional challenge for me. Um, I lived prior to this in South Africa. Uh, South Africa was a challenge for foreigners. And then coming to the United States was a beacon of hope for me and realization of American dream. Was that, was that true? To an extent, yes. To a large extent, no. 
why did I say that? So when I came here, the I first came uh, through the scape of xenophobic attacks leveled against foreign nationals. That's minus the problem that I fled Somalia, the civil war. Um, in South Africa, I had my legal status as a refugee, hoping that after five years I'll qualify to be a South African and then operate like any other South African. Little did I know that I was not given that opportunity, even though I had my master's degree from South Africa. Uh, joining my family who moved here a long time ago as a family reunification, as well as running away from the xenophobic attacks, was for me a picture of hope, as I said earlier on. But coming to Green Bay for me in 2015 was a combination of happiness and at the same time I felt that I wasn't fitting in one of the communities. Um, I was considered black African American, but I'm not black African American. I'm black, but not African American. You know, under that definition, I found a little bit irony because in, in South Africa, I called myself Somali because there were other blacks in there. So the definition wasn't actually telling what barriers I was carrying. The only way they could identify me as Somali is just like I was Somali speaking, and those are some of the agencies such, uh, such as the school district or um, the hospitals, the health system could identify me as Somali speaking. And that's the only way that can be identified from any other black African American. So having said that, um, I volunteered in the Job Center West Cancer. I saw firsthand what the refugees and immigrants were facing, barriers. And then the idea of council was born having some consultation with uh, folks in the area, the religious groups, elders, the women, youth, then we decided to have COMSA as a non-profit organization that is going to serve individuals like me who are not having easy time to, to fit into the society and navigate resources around. So COMSA is actually exists to remove barriers uh, made by, you know, was created by refugee for refugees uh, to, to, to remove the barriers where, where we can in the following areas. Education, um, we have a third school program. Most of the kids that come to Comsa either had interrupted learning or a gap in their learning. They were in, in the refugee camps and they never had any substantial education. Health. There's a lot of health, preferably health issues, preferably mental health, which is not yet a problem that's not solved within, uh, within the community. How, you know, mental health by itself is a very foreign concept. So how do, you, how do you let the providers understand what mental health is in our community? How can, you, how can the community understand what mental health means. So that's a, a, a word battle that we are trying to fight every day and we don't have an answer yet. Social issues or employment. Um, there's a lot of discrimination within the employment area. Uh, we have been working uh, closely with some companies who employ refugees, immigrants. Some of them have been very nice in accommodating them and creating an environment where refugees and immigrants can coexist with their uh, other co-workers. But there are others within Green Bay area that we are trying to, to work together. You know, our, our job is not to provoke anyone. It's our job is just to help them so that they can have employees who come every day because they are valued and the employees get paid. That's what they are coming for and they get also valued as a human being. But there's a lot of subtle um, discrimination going on um, that we are working with uh, you know area um, you know communities to make sure that we tackle it housing is the another challenge that we are tackling that I'm going to let Aaron Bure to talk about briefly but Green Bay has been we have been losing home uh, families to Minneapolis 
specific to Guinea Bissau and Saint Paul because there is a large existing uh, refugees uh, area in, in that area. So there were two, there were certain elements that were acting as push and pull factor. So when we talk about when we when I got to Minneapolis and talk about you know Green Bay, eventually with folks like me who got six seven kids, they they want Green Bay because they want somewhere quieter for their kids, and that can be a bull factor for them. But what are the push factors? Things like non-existence of culturally customized childcare. Because classical example is my wife. She's currently compound. She's not working. And one thing is we have three kids which are almost like triple, triplets uh, that needs, uh, you know, culturally customized daycare. And we cannot, cannot find, find it here. And uh, before COVID, my wife moved to Minneapolis just to work. And uh, when COVID happened, she decided to come back because, you know, daycares were closed. So I, I brought my wife back because of COVID-19. So that's one thing I could say COVID-19 has done for me. <laughs> so, and then um, what are the other push factors? You know, like jobs, you know. In, in Minneapolis, there are a lot of areas where there are established businesses, you know, by former foreigners who can easily employ those folks. And they can easily walk the way they want to walk, the way they, they can talk the way they want to talk. Nobody charges them, but they do the work, actually, that person wants them to work, and that person understands their culture. And the other thing is housing. And I, want, I, don't, I don't want to talk about housing a lot. I, I haven't got a lot of, because um, he works in the front desk and meets this every day. So housing was another culprit that was acting as a push factor, that individuals come in here, they stay for some time looking for housing. They stay with friends and families, you know, at a given time when they couldn't find affordable housing or a housing that fits their family size, they end up going back. So I'm going to invite my colleague, Aaron Bure, to take it from there. Thank you very much, Lee. Thank you very much for all of you for, for having me here today. I appreciate the opportunity to stand in front of you and talk about housing issue that I deal with every single day. Um, the first thing I want to tell you, I was reading something today, and it says housing is a human rights issue and it's getting expensive. It's really getting expensive in Green Bay. I've been here 12 years. When I first moved, moved in Green Bay 12 years ago, I was paying $650, and today that apartment cost $1,100. It's still the same size, it's still the same location. Nothing has been done to it all that time, but just rent to keep increasing. And it's even more so for individuals who are immigrant and refugees because, actually I can speak for myself, but they cannot speak for themselves. Yesterday I had a single mother who come to, came to the office and she had two papers, one from Section 8 and one from the landlord. The landlord was asking $1,600 for one month rent because he was double charging her. One, one February, now this month, uh, April 1st, he was charging her $740. And at the same month, he was charging her $940. When I called the company, they say the rent increased last month. So they were charging her $940 for the same apartment that she was renting for $750. Section 8 is only willing to pay $740. She's not working, single mother, and she doesn't have a way to pay the difference. So she was asking us if we can help her out. I called the company, I called Section 8, I'm still waiting to call from Section 8. So what can organizations um, like you can do to alleviate the housing shortage? Because if we had more housing in Green Bay, Wisconsin, it's a great place to live. It's a great place to raise kids. It's, we have great schools. We have opportunity to bring people from other areas, particularly immigrants, but we can't bring the immigrants in Green Bay, Wisconsin, if we don't have housing. We have the, the new Afghan refugees in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and some of them were living in R&Bs and the university campuses until recently because we just didn't have housing. People, I know Catholic Charities trying as best as it can, but you can't, they can't build a home in a couple of weeks. 
So we need a long-term planning for housing for anybody. It doesn't have to be only for refugees, but we need long-term housing planning for people of low income. Because every single person is not going to be a doctor or a lawyer. We need a working people's homes so they can afford and live decent, decent areas with a comfortable rent. You don't have to pay two-bedroom apartment for $950. That increased in, in just two months. In addition to that, a lot of Somalian families with, large, with a lot of children are moving out of Wisconsin to, Green, uh, to Minnesota because they just simply cannot find the large homes to accommodate their children. What can we do as a community, as a city, as a, a county to encourage landlords to build homes that are more than two bedrooms or three bedrooms? They need four or five bedrooms because they have six, seven, eight, nine, ten kids. If you have ten kids and you're living three bedroom, that's not going to be feasible. It's one, the code doesn't allow. Second, every room is going to be three people. It's too, it's, you can't, you can't, you, you can't have a reasonable accommodation for children if they live in three or four in one bedroom. So what can, what can we do to alleviate that situation so we don't have families moving in every six months, every three months, every three months we have three or four families moving out of Wisconsin, Green Bay to Minnesota because they simply cannot find large homes to accommodate their large families. That's all I have to say. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to give you specific examples of individuals that we helped who were struggling, who literally had to move out of Green Bay because they just could not find housing. Thank you very much. I just wanted to add uh, one remark on, specifically on uh, housing itself. In Minnesota, I've been communicating with folks who are purchasing homes. So there's, you know, traditional mortgage or traditional financing doesn't suit some of the refugees who prescribe to the Islamic culture. So there's an fi Islamic financing program, they call it Marahaba, which we, we have done with, um, actually, um, last year, fall, we have done a, a research with uh, La Follette St um, and School of uh, Public Affairs, I think, in, in Madison. They did a, a research with us about secondary migrants. And some, those are some of the recommendations I, I can share with the commissioners. They want that. That's one of the research paper that we have uh, participated as a COMSA with other uh, refugee task force group that was, by the time, contributing to that research. So Morahaba is one of the um, you know, financing that's not available in Green Bay, as I know. I'm not sure about Milwaukee or other areas or Madison, but within Green Bay area, we, if, if we need to include those individuals to have, you know, who are willing to purchase uh, or maybe own homes, those kind of financing should be considered. That's available in the Twin Cities? That's correct. Mohammed Rahe, my colleague who co-founded Comsa with me, got his uh, five bedroom through the uh, financing system. Forgive my ignorance, what is different about that, that system? I'm not a, a commissioner, I'm not a, <coughs> uh, econ econ no, I'm not a CPA, I don't know exactly how that works, but the, it's more about the interest. This, the interest is actually uh, considered as a profit rather than interest. So they, there's, a, there's a different verbiage in, in their consideration and the way they calculate that mortgage. Okay, thank you. No problem. I have a question. So the families that are moving to Minneapolis that need those large homes, they're finding the houses in Minneapolis to buy and to rent? To rent. To rent. To rent, but to rent. not so much to buy? Not so much to buy, but okay. the majority, the ones that I know of, the ones that I've been communicating with, normally rent, they find the apartment to, to rent in Minneapolis, unlike, unlike Green Bay. Right, larger, because it's right. hard to find those, exactly. those larger units, yep. Right. Okay. So, so uh, there was a, I think there was a, 
uh, representation in the in Minnesota area that uh, someone from a refugee descent was occupying a substantive position within the city of Minneapolis uh, about specific on housing. And there was another position on economic development where individuals were included, uh, so to speak, from top up. Um, so I, I answered that question for those folks who are low income, mm -hmm. but folks who are professionals and who are able to purchase homes who are ending up purchasing homes in, in Minneapolis. So as far as I know, I know a few folks who are professional teachers and nurses and doctors who, are, who own homes. And uh, I know them, I can count them like 10 right now that I know. In Green Bay, I think, uh, apart from the Habitat, of, Habitat for Humanity, which is actually also a very lengthy waiting process, which requires a lot of time from families to you know, we do have about three to four families who own homes through that program. Other than that, you know, we, we don't have um, ownership in, for, you know, within the refugees and immigrants, but we have a lot of renters. Uh, for, first of all, uh, Aden, thank you for being here tonight. I um, really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> You know, you, you talked about Section 8 vouchers, and this is something we talked about the, in our first set of hearings. You know, you, you advocate with and for a lot of families. Do you find landlords, I, I want to put this delicately, but do, do you find that they uh, tend to discriminate against folks with Section 8 vouchers, and specifically do they, do they discriminate against refugees who have Section 8 vouchers? They definitely do discriminate if you have a Section 8 voucher. There are only certain limited areas that are willing to accept Section 8 housing. If you go to Howard, if you go to Howard, uh, Suamico area, you're not going to be able to find uh, any houses that are accepting Section 8. Areas that have good schools normally do not accept Section 8 because Let's be honest, there's only one reason I can think of, it's just to keep those people who are coming from, who look different from coming to those schools. I've lived in Connecticut for a long time, and the areas, wealthy areas, do not know, hardly ever, either have accepted Section 8, nor do they have a public housing in their towns because they do not want to dilute the few, the optics that they want to project. They don't want to, they want to keep those schools specifically, specifically segregated. So that's why they don't allow. In Green Bay, if you live in the West, areas that, that, that the schools are just normal schools, they're not really, really top of the line. Yes, they do accept the 60 days a lot of times, but even those who are accepted 60 days, we have a landlord who had a lot of Somalians one time, and the, every single year they kick out two or three or four to the point to where now there's only maybe two Somalian families living in that complex. Each one of them, without a reason, um, when, when the lease expires, she tells them, it's time for you to go. No explanation. The lease, you have a right to give me, this is what she normally says, you have a right to tell me to leave, and I have a right to tell you when your lease expires, you, you, you have a right to leave. So they leave because they have to leave. Because yeah, the sad reality is uh, accent is, a, is a definitely um, a problem. I had the same problem when I was getting my family back from Minneapolis. I had to give my phone to someone who has an American accent to look for me apartments. And I'm saying this out of... Uh, out of you know experience, so right now Comsa is this is a this is a hard truth. Comsa is um, we are growing, we are growing in terms of um, you know individuals who are resources. We are growing our resources, so we will be adding a housing specialist, and that ha doesn't have to look like me and Adam. So if I could ask a follow-up question, one of the things we're trying to do with this commission is to think about some really big. Um, some really big recommendations. I mean, like, number one, how do we get 
more affordable housing for folks you know, in, in, in Green Bay. And as you said, this is an issue for refugee folks, but it's an issue for lots of people too, lots of other people too. Um, but in terms of smaller things that we can advocate for, I mean, one of the things that strikes me is, you know, we, we should have some resources for renters when they feel like they've been a victim of discrimination or somebody's not, right? So, so that you don't have to have a housing coordinator. You know, maybe that's something the city could invest in. So if, if you're noticing somebody's having a hard time with a landlord, Maybe you have the, the city provide an advocate, right, who's, on, who's specifically on the sides of tenants, right? I mean, do you think that would be something that, that might help folks, especially who are looking for housing and running into this brick wall of people either not taking Section 8 vouchers or it being an issue because of their accent? Like, do you think something like that would be helpful? I think any time that you can combat a discrimination, whether it is your color, your religion, your skin, or your language, it's a great thing. At any time that you allow people to have a fair share in life, it's wonderful. If the city can invest in that position, I would wholeheartedly support it. I think it would be wonderful. I think it would be a place where the tenants can report landlords who are not fixing the apartments and when something is broken, they're not fixing it. So as soon as the, land, the, the tenants leave the apartment, they, they charge an outrageous charges because they have not been fixing anything for the last two or three years the tenant was living in the apartment. Where, and the, the families can't afford it. I, rem, I remember I was just talking to a, a, a gentleman who moved from here to Chicago, and they sent him a bill for $3,000 and they took his, after they deducted the deposit. So the, the bill was $5,000, they took his deposit, now he owes them $3,000, and, and the, he doesn't have a way to pay for that, because they have not fixed anything while he was living there. Every time he called, they, they said, we will send someone, nobody showed up to fix it, those damages, and now they're saying, because it happened while you were in the apartment, we don't care. And we're going to charge you Matt the Great to replace every single thing. So if, if he had a place to go, that would, that would have been a great, great avenue for him. Thank you. Appreciate that. The other, the other thing that's also uh, that we need to, as a commission, is going to look into is, and I have a question about uh, you know, some of the things that I've been seeing uh, about price regulation. You know. There was one. There, there are a few landlords who specifically rent to refugees and immigrants, and they ask way, way too much. So, in that respect, where can we draw the line? Who can we speak to? Is it going to be issues regarding uh, consumer protection? Is it, you know, falls under some some other areas? So, those are some of the things that we we have been seeing a lot, and. The other thing is individuals just come and sign whatever they want to sign because they are, just like the issues we are, John and I have been working with in terms of employment uh, discrimination, they sign because they don't have housing. They, they, have, they want something, they want a roof over the head of their, for, their, for their kids. So they just do anything and everything. They don't even understand the language they are signing and they do it just for the sake of for their kids. So in that respect, everything else sorts of like this gentleman who moved out and he was, they took his deposit and then now they told him to give another $3,000. So there is a great, great deal of discrimination from any facet, from any angle. So it's not just where can we start. It's, what, it's just the holistic way of understanding uh, this ugly animal of how can we tackle it, you know. But you're saying there are some landlords that are charging refugees more than they would charge someone That's else. Correct. It happens in the Hispanic community as well. Sure. Can I freely speak, or do I have to raise my hand? Yeah, How does this work? I think so. So, <clears throat> I, so we work in the prevention field, right? And so my 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 challenge is if it, is that's fantastic to have a position like that, right? But will that then discourage landlords just just stop just stop messing with Section Eight to begin with because? So is it more about where oppression thrives on misunderstanding and alienation? So maybe instead, is there a better opportunity to, and I've seen some of these 
be pop up all over the place of landlord um, information and maybe having people like yourselves go and talk to these landlords directly and having the city be behind that and have those open sessions and maybe that's already on your calendar but talking about why it is they feel the way they feel because there's so much misunderstanding about different communities right we all are human we make our own stigmas about different communities and i have learned so much knowing saeed just for the past couple of years that i had no i had my own misconceptions about um the, the Somali culture, and I admit that. And I went to the trainings, I think, five years ago about how to work with people from Somalia, and we generalize, right, and, and instead of asking the questions. And so I feel like more time could be spent instead of not necessarily attacking the landlords, because I know that's what you're not, you're not doing, because believe me, this is happening. For the Hispanic community, just as much as it's happening for the Somali community, it's happening for any refugee, really all anyone low income. I mean, they're... We, we saw a huge increase after COVID of exactly what you described. Rent was 700 and then all of a sudden the next month rent was 1000 And the justification was, well, I, you didn't have to pay your rent all the way during COVID, and so now I have to charge you more, right? And so that, that was a double-edged sword for many of our families, that, that moratorium, because it gave almost landlords, in some aspects, permission to all of a sudden start charging all of this money with a justification, right? And so it, it almost is, is like that, where is that opportunity for education of all of these landlords? And then maybe more landlords would actually take Section 8 if we could sit them down and talk to them about that these are just human beings. And there is, I think, work to be done on the Section 8 side of things, though, about education for families that are going into apartments. I think you don't know what you don't know. And so just like we have a parenting program that meets with you as a brand new parent and helps you along that journey, if you've never been a tenant or you've grown up in citrical poverty where you've never seen a generational poverty, where you've never seen the, you only see what you saw, right? And then so you don't understand why you can't have people over all hours of the night or you can't leave your garbage cans out or whatever the, the reason is people are being evicted, even the wrong reasons, if they had more education themselves and we could inform the tenants just as much, then maybe the landlords wouldn't have all these excuses to say, well, now you're gonna leave, right? And so I think it's a two-edged sword of like that understanding for landlords and having those open conversations with landlords. Because my fear is if we say, we're gonna develop this and this is gonna keep those landlords from doing what they're supposed to be doing, then landlords don't have to accept Section 8. Is that my understanding? You don't have to accept Section 8 as a landlord. So if you don't have to accept it, and if it's too much work, then you're going to have less landlords accepting it, and then we're really going to be in crisis. But I think the issue we're talking about here is a little different than, than you described, you articulately described the situations, but it's just a little different. That this is only applies to people of certain color or certain Oh, ethnicity. absolutely. We work with and Hispanics. The, and when, mm -hmm. when you are being singled out, we, we've tried to talk to, we try to talk to the landlord, and the, the only thing that she says is, I have right to do this. Right. You have right to do. You you're right. This is your property. You yeah. are the manage, management, the property management. So you have you have a right. Mm -hmm. But at least explain to the individual why they're being affected, except that you have right to do. Absolutely. We all have right to do certain things, but does it necessarily mean we have to do it? I mean, it, it it's really. It, it, it's illogical for me to sit here and say that it, it is the right of a landlord to evict someone without giving a proper notice or a proper explanation. Tell me why you're evicting me so at least I know in, in my heart why I'm being evicted so I can correct it even if I made a mistake. But if you're not telling me anything, what do I need to correct? And what, there's one thing about Somalians, they, they, you can say anything else about them. But they always pay the rent on time. Mm -hmm. They will ne they would rather forgo food than not pay the rent because they want to make sure that they have a roof over their heads. In addition to what we've discussed so far, are there any other enforcement mechanisms that you would encourage uh, the commission and the city to think about to hold landlords more accountable? when they are engaging in discriminatory behavior? Great question. I think that's a great question. 
honestly. And one more thing I would add is there are sometimes landlords who purchase apartments. And if there are tenants who have a lease, so as soon as these landlords purchase the property, they raise the rent. Even though these tenants have a, a lease with the previous landlord. And they're saying, I don't have any, I don't care about the previous lease that you had with the landlord. Either you s sign a new lease with me, or you get evicted. I, there should be a, some rule or regulation somewhere that says, if the person has a lease, either with this, with the previous owner, when you sell the property, you have to allow until the lease expires before you either increase the rent outrageously or you affect the people. There should be some mechanism somewhere people can go to get redressed for these situations like that. Because there's a guy who bought a lot of property in Green Bay and he's really, really, did, he did a damage to several Somalian individuals that I know. couple of resources, and I'll give you my card, and they are not by any means at the level they need to be in the city. I'll okay. give you that. But we do have a person under contract who used to work for the Consumer Protection Division. You know, those divisions kind of went away with the prior governor. Those departments did. But we were able to hire this guy who's worked for, for 30 years for consumer protection. And he is a landlord. He's our residential um, Invest, we call him the residential, I think, investigator. Bob Zaspel is his name. He's under contract with the city for the purpose of tenants to call and ask questions to with regards to, is this legal? Can I do this? And he can get involved with the landlord to kind of negotiate with the landlord or inform the landlord what they're doing is not legal. So we, we have that one resource. And we also, through our block grant programs, we are under contract with Milwaukee Metropolitan Youth Fair Housing which is an agency that will follow up on like racial discrimination, or they'll send testers out if they need to, or if there's a specific landlord that we think there's a problem with, but they'll investigate that and they'll follow up with those complaints uh, for fair housing. So we do have a couple of resources. Again, I, I'm sure that we need more than what we have, but at least we have something that would help out some, you know, like the guy with that $3,000 bill that he got when he left. I mean, you're supposed to itemize that within 21 days, you know. And there are some certain things, of course, that tenants can learn how to do as well to protect themselves, right? A lot of pictures when you move out. And, and that's more of like that tenant, that's yep. more of that tenant education. Uh, we're finding with our families when they get a new apartment, uh, as part of our home visiting is helping that family walk alongside. Did you get pictures of the apartment? Yep. Did you, can we, let, let us help you investigate your lease so we can see that, yep, they do have the right, because sometimes a lease will say right on there, unfortunately, if we're purchased, we, you may be evicted, right? And so then helping understand that, even though it's not fair, right? It sure isn't fair, but if it's in the lease, then it's a legal you know, document. And so that education of the tenants, I think, is because then you have educated tenants who will be able to stand up and say, no. I, and maybe they're not going to stand up to the landlord because they fear retribution, because that happens too. I'm sure you've seen that in your community. But at least be able to call then and know to call that resource. Quick follow-up question, Cheryl. Where, where is it publicly known that that uh, person exists that you're talking about? You know, I'm not sure if it's on our website or if it's just, I think, we've been using him primarily. He's like 20 hours a week uh -huh. um, through our inspection division. Because we get a lot of our complaints through our, with our housing inspectors because they're working with the tenants. And they're like, boy, this doesn't sound right. So we'll refer those tenants to Bob. So, But um, it's it's one of those where it's a limited resource. Yeah. So we don't have them full time. But, right. um, but, but yeah, I can certainly share that. It's not... It's not private information, right. it's public information. Well, that, I mean, to me, like, as we're having these conversations, that's low-hanging fruit. Like, that's, that should be something where if somebody's having a problem with their landlord, or, or if Auden is having a problem helping, you know, somebody in the community, he goes to the city website and says, what resources do I have? It would be, like, that, at the very least, that should be there to know, like, hey, you can set up an appointment with this person and they can advocate for you, mm -hmm. you know? That would be great. There's also the Tenant Resource side. Center. It just, it's, a, it's a state of Wisconsin resource, so it's not local. Mm -hmm. But I've had pretty good luck with my clients reaching out to them or myself when we think there's something going on um, to at least 
educate them on what their rights as a tenant are. So they may not necessarily reach out to the landlord as I don't know if this person would or not, but at least it's some type of education. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I, the Asian American um, community resonates with some of the s similar situations and stories that you've shared as well. We do see a lot of um, some of our families moving out of Green Bay because there's resources in different um, cities, and Minnesota is obviously you know one of the main ones that we move out to, um, and so you know we are in the same predicament and. I have no easy answer to, you know, to solve it, but I just want to say that you guys aren't alone in your issues, and it's very, it's quite um, prevalent in, our, in the marginalized communities here. Yeah, I think uh, that concludes our, you know, our section. If you have any questions, I will be able to take it, but... Uh, yeah, um, we, we are almost closing, to, uh, nearing towards the end of our breakfast, you know. Yeah. So, Adam, do you have more energy to talk? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. We appreciate thank both you. of you um, taking your time to come meet with us today. I know you guys have religious commitments, so I appreciate you so much, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you so much. Thank you for coming. Have a lovely day. Yeah. 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 All right, so while we transition, um, I wanted to invite our next guest up here, um, Amanda. No, no, um, our, our mic, we are recording this because it does is it is a public meeting, so we do have to upload it to the to the website, but um, if you can speak a little bit louder so that the mic can catch you, um, okay. but you're fine where you are. Uh, Amanda is um, an associate with um, Golden House, yep. correct? Yep. I'm the Rapid Rehousing Case Manager with Golden House. Um, so I just kind of talk about housing? Yeah, yep, okay. you can um, introduce yourself and your position there and maybe give a little overview of Golden House. Yeah. So Golden House serves victims of domestic violence in our community, um, men, women, children, anyone. We have our own shelter where we will shelter people when they're actively fleeing. But then my program specifically, we provide rental assistance for up to two years. And then I also do intensive case management with, with them. So um, we do sometimes monthly up to weekly home visits, depending on each person's scenario. And then um, also other types of case management, making sure they're getting their housing, we're working with the landlords. Um, getting them connected to food share, health insurance, whatever they need, um, kind of when starting over. So housing is my life every day. I work with landlords. They're a different breed. No offense if anyone's a landlord, but they really are. Um, I resonate a lot with what they were saying before, just about one, discrimination. Specifically with domestic violence, a lot of times I'll hear people say they don't want that person's partner coming over there and ruining the house. So they're not going to rent to that person because of another person's actions. Um, they don't want trouble. They don't want these certain things. If I've had landlords in front of me say to my clients, if she calls the police, I'm going to evict her because I don't want police contact at my property. Um, so then my clients call me that something happened, but they won't call the cops because they're scared to get evicted. Um, we also have landlords that, while we provide rental assistance and a double security deposit for our clients, they will still ask for a sign-on bonus. So outside of double security deposit, they want a triple sign-on bonus. So that will not be returned to our agency or the client because it's not a security deposit. It's just for them working with us that they get that. Um, and we have chosen not to work with those people because one, we don't, as a nonprofit agency, have the funds to do that. And if we do have those extra funds, we would actually like it to go towards our clients maybe getting a new vehicle or getting their driver's license, things that are more practical versus that person putting more money in their bank account when they're already overcharging. Um, so we do see the overcharging for rent as well. Um, HUD this year actually lowered its standards for reasonable rent, so don't know how that happened, but um, within our program, rent needs to be considered reasonable, and that's determined by HUD. 
and HUD decided that those amounts are going down this year. So a studio is just over $500, and that's next to impossible to find, especially with a landlord that's willing to work with us. Because um, not only do these discriminate against Section 8, but then also our program as well, uh, because we're considered housing, and they just, doesn't matter who you are, what it is, they do not want housing. Um, so it's very, very challenging for us to find people a place to rent. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of people have to exit our program before we can ever find them housing because we are on a time limit, according to our funders. Um, so, anything else? Uh, I also resonated with them saying that landlords don't fix anything. Um, and a lot of these places, we do inspections. Like, it has to pass an inspection, which really it's just habitable. It's not even that great of living conditions, I'm going to be completely honest. Um, what HUD determines to pass inspection is just a habitable building. Habitable building. It's not abandoned. Um, so like right now I have a client that her tub hasn't drained water in a month and she has four kids. So she bathes them in the tub or in the shower or in the sink, sorry, in the kitchen. Um, because the tub won't drain and the landlord doesn't answer us. He doesn't call. He doesn't answer her, doesn't show up. But then as soon as rent isn't there for a day for the bad ones. So it's very, very challenging. Um, it's really, really sad because a lot of our clients are just trying to get safety and we're trying to get them that as well and to maintain their housing. So it's probably the biggest, one of the biggest challenges I would say as a whole agency that we face. Um, Cause even outside of our program, if people are staying in, in my, my program, if people are staying in shelter, their goal is to also get them safe, stable housing. So then those advocates are struggling with the same thing that I am. And then I'm the housing person, so they come to me and I'm like, I'm having the same trouble. So we kind of go in this circle um, of housing, which is really, really challenging. So that's kind of um, just my overall of landlords and the challenges that I see every day. And then, I, oh, the family sizes, that's another one that I resonated with. Um, finding anything larger than a two-bedroom is next to impossible. And if it is, it's usually actually out in like Howard, Swamico, maybe not in the city limits. And those landlords don't want to work with us either for whatever reason. Um, so then people can't get housing purely because of their family size, which is another form of discrimination. They're being discriminated by how many kids they have. Um, that need to live with them. So then landlords are saying, nope, that's too many people living here. We can't have that. So it's another big challenge for us too. Have you seen anyone successfully um, transition from renting into purchasing a house? None of my people have ever purchased a house. Um, and this program has been going for about four years. Um, we definitely have success of people continuing renting from whether it's the landlord that we kind of connected them with or they move out and find another one, um, but never purchased a house. It's just renting. So, and then sometimes, too, like what I've kind of seen with slumlords, what we always call them, which unfortunately we're kind of, that's our only option to work with because no one else will take our housing program. Um, the amount of like fines and things that they try to do to it seems like they try to evict our clients, in all honesty. Um, if your garbage can isn't out within 12 hours of it being picked up, it's $50 fine. But then again, they won't come over and fix a lock on a door. Um, I even have a landlord, the one with the tub situation. I said, I will coordinate a plumber going there. If you pay for it, I will call them, I will set it up, I will go there, I will do all of it. Never did anything. So even to take that work off of the landlord, as long as they pay for it, because that is their responsibility, um, still nothing. So I don't know what the answer is to hold landlords more accountable. I do like the idea of a person through the city. My only concern with that is, um, like you said, retribution towards the renter, um, because that definitely happens as well, where I wouldn't want them to come back. and Because in all honesty, landlords can find any reason to evict somebody in my opinion because it's their business, which I understand everyone has the right to run their business as they wish, but it gets to a point where it's just like inhuman to me. Um, so even if that was available, I feel like it would deter people from continuing to work with housing programs. And the last thing they want is more people asking them what they're doing with their homes and how they're renting them. Um, so that's kind of what we deal with at Golden House. 
So first of all, thanks for being here. We really appreciate it. We know you're doing a lot of important work, and being here is, you know, another thing. Yeah. Um, you know, so I guess what I was kind of picturing is almost like an ombuds person kind of thing. So n okay. not necessarily somebody who would, you know, like necessarily put more pressure on folks, but kind of give them, you know, arm them with more resources and strategies for kind of dealing with some of these folks. Okay. Um, but, you know, it's, I don't think anything like that is going to solve all of these problems. Right. I have a couple of other questions, but I guess my first question is, you know, you, you, you mentioned the folks in your program who leave without a place to go. Like, what, maybe this is a dumb question, but what happens to them? Um, sometimes people, unfortunately, end up homeless again because landlords choose not to rent to them or... They choose not to take Section 8 because that a lot of times if our clients, for whatever reason, maybe can't maintain employment that would pay rent, we would try to get them a voucher. And a lot of people are approved to for a voucher, but because they also have to follow HUD standards of rent, it's not affordable for many places that would take that voucher. And then also, sometimes landlords, for whatever reason, will accept our program, but not that. So then when their time is coming to exit our program, they have a voucher, but they won't find another landlord that would accept that voucher. Even if they were a great tenant while they were in our program, that landlord will still not take that voucher. So then they unfortunately end up homeless again. Um, right now I have somebody that is planning to go to Arizona by her mom because she doesn't have any other option. So her and her six kids are going to live with mom in one house. Like it's um, really sad that they then have to leave this area too. So, the second question is, um, you know, you kind of talked about this a little bit, but, you know, like I said, one of the things we're trying to do is come up with a, you know, set of recommendations. Um, can you talk about how, from, from your perspective, uh, this issue of housing is an issue of, of gender equality in our community? Um, so, I would say definitely uh, that stigma of domestic violence that comes along with it. One, most people do think of women as being a victim when we know that's not true, but the majority of people in my program are women. So trying to find them housing is very challenging because they may not have worked because while in their relationship they've experienced a lot of financial abuse or this the power and control that their abusers have over them, they aren't allowed to work. They aren't allowed to go to school. They aren't allowed to have access to money. So then um, they don't have or they were never allowed to talk to the landlords where they rented with their partner. And so they don't have any skills to find a place to rent. Like they just don't even know where to begin or how to talk to a landlord or what's reasonable, what's not. So then those slumlords that come at them and say, yep, it's a thousand dollars a month for the studio apartment. These are your fees if you don't do this, this, and this. And they're like, sounds great because they just want a place to live. Um, so I would say that's, it's more that they're taken advantage of because they haven't had those experiences before. Um, I would also say that, again, they don't want trouble. So when they learn that they're working with our program, they immediately think that this person's going to go over there and just tear this house to shreds. When really that's not true because to for our program, they aren't living with their abuser. They're fleeing that person. So just because that's in their past doesn't mean that they're inviting that person to their home. Um, our goal is to create a safe space for them, but they just have that stigma of domestic violence. Um, a lot of our clients, too, for financial abuse, their partners will put things in their name and ruin their credit, um, get them into all this debt. Maybe their last apartment was in that, the victim's name, and they got evicted because the partner wasn't paying the rent. They were doing something else with that money. So then the eviction's in her name. And then we have to fight not only the stigma that we're going in with the housing program, but then they have an eviction. They haven't worked in this long because they never did because their partner didn't want them to. Um, all those different things. So it's very challenging to sell landlords that they'll be a good tenant. No, thank you for that. So that's really, really um, an important explanation. So if, if, if you had a magic wand and you could like forget about resources, you know, like what, what, what would be like the first thing you would do to like change things to make it better for people? Oh gosh. Um, I just want spaces for my families to go. 
whether it's the city owns them, private people own them, but I just want people that will look at, I don't get emotional because I love my job, um, look at our clients as people because I feel like they don't. So, um, I'm sorry, I feel That's like okay. okay. but I just, I love my job. So, um, I just want them to be seen as people and not like on this piece of paper, you're a housing program, so you don't matter. And I know that's what they feel like. Um, so that's what I want. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> feel so. No. Not at all. Not at all. It's extremely challenging work. Yes. And, and I just love It's very understandable <laughs> to feel emotional when you discuss it. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So... You know, going back to what Amanda was saying earlier, um, I think you weren't here just yet, but she was talking about some of the family, some of the kids that struggle, struggle yeah. um, at the Howe um, School here. And so, you know, have you seen, you know, for the, the families of children, yeah. um, what do you see are the, the effects of that? And do you think there's anything that could be done? Um, yeah. I see a lot when people don't have stable, secure housing, then their kids, nothing is stable for them. Um, when they don't know where they're sleeping, a lot of times they're not going to go to school, so then their education, they're falling behind. Um, they may be bouncing around to different schools, um, and they don't feel safe either. And so then, you know, we have kids stay in our shelter a lot, and we work a lot on their behaviors and things like that because they mimic what they see um so they will be aggressive um have a lot of behavioral issues and then not having that structure of going to school and correcting that behavior it's going to continue um we also see sometimes kids become runaways or homeless themselves a lot it is a cycle so one of our advocates has been at golden house for like almost 30 years and now we have people that are as adults staying in our shelter leaving their abuser but she knew them as kids so it is that cycle that they just cannot break. So they get into that too. Um, and unfortunately, the majority of women that are, have experienced homelessness have also experienced domestic violence because a lot of people, when you're homeless, you just are trying to get your needs met, however that is. So people will enter into re unhealthy relationships really quickly because, oh, I'll drive you to work. I'll get you a job. Stay with me for a little bit. I'll take care of you and your kids. And then it becomes very abusive because then they also have that power and control so that person's trying to get them and their kids needs met and this person's offering that but they're really controlling and mean and abusive so um, that's another really big thing that I don't think people see about homelessness is you're just trying to get your needs met however you can even if it means getting into some really scary stuff and so then that cycle continues because that's how they saw their parents meet their needs Yeah, well, thank you so much, Amanda, for coming tonight. We appreciate all the insight that you've been able to share with us. Yeah. Um, what, you know, I, I missed this earlier. Um, what I meant to say was we are going to use um, the insight that we get gather from the public and local organizations to put together recommendations for the city. Okay. Awesome. Um, and um, Cheryl is here from the city. She is the... Deputy director. Yeah. Director. Yeah, I'm listening to you. I'm getting fired up. <laughs> oh yeah, I could talk about, about this all day. It's my bread and butter. Have you had a, like, have you had bad experiences with inspection? Like the story you told in my head, SOP would be call the inspection department. We go out, send orders. Can't evict someone after the orders. That's what we've got the other mm -hmm. guy for to follow up on that. But have you had bad experiences working, like doing that standard route of inspection? Like our landlords booting people out and... Um, not necessarily because of inspection. Okay. Um, I will say some landlords are like, why do you need to do that? And it's more work for them, so they don't want to. Right. And we have our own person at Golden House that does our inspections. Um, she's certified and everything, so we're really lucky that we don't have to outsource for that. So um, I'm, th I'm talking about like complaints. Like you're oh. going to the city because you're, the, the tenant's making a complaint because the the landlord won't fix something. Oh, no, I haven't. So a lot of, I haven't had clients calling the city to do that. Okay. Um, usually they call me, and then we try to work with the landlords. Um, and that's always the best case. Yes. To try to, but yep. let's face it, there are some bad landlords out there. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm probably getting to that point with one landlord right now, to be completely honest, because I actually wrote him a letter that this tub hasn't been draining, and then she also, like, her porch door 
it was like when we had really bad, I think it was snowstorms or something, and the porch door literally flew off. And that's still just sitting there crooked. Um, so I wrote him a letter saying, you know, per our program, the house needs to meet XYZ standards, and until it does, we're not going to pay you rent. It's been two months. We haven't paid him rent, but we haven't heard from him either, and he hasn't fixed it. So I don't know if he just doesn't get his mail, if he doesn't care, but I'm like, I'm going to take the risk, and I'm not going to pay rent for until he fixes it because she's been there for about a year now, and that's mm -hmm. how long this has been going on, and he says he'll fix it, so I'm sending someone over there. Nothing. So then my boss was like, let's try this. So we're trying it out because we got to do something because her and her four kids can't live like that. So it's really sad. So they come to a golden house to shower and do their laundry and eat sometimes because they can't do it at their home. So how many times have, would you say in the last few years have you actually lodged a complaint with the city? Personally, me, never. Right. And again, I think it's just out of fear that then they wouldn't work with me again in our program because even as terrible as some of these landlords are, if that's my only option, I've told my boss sometimes, I'm like, I want this family housed more than I want to be morally correct right now. Like, I just want these people off the street. Um, so unfortunately, I haven't for that reason because I have a few options and I can't risk the, giving that up. No, that totally makes sense. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify. Yep. Yeah. All right, well, if there's no further questions, Amanda, thank you so much thank for your you. time. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. Okay, so our next presenter, our guest speaker is Amanda. Or I think they need you. Actually. Well, I just have to grab something real sure. quick. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I think a lot has already been said. Um, I think a couple things that I would want to add to this is that um, so we were so I in my my work um, before I was an executive director here I actually ran the soft program which was called supporting our families together and unfortunately it doesn't exist anymore and that program was an answer to families either waiting to get into shelter um, that were um, in the school systems because the kids were experiencing homelessness obviously or to get into housing and so that program ran for about four years and we would put them up in hotels. Um, and then work with landlords to try, try to get them in housing. So I unfortunately saw the ugly side of exactly what they're talking about where um, landlords will just refuse to flat out rent or the apartment will be open and I will have a family call and they'll, um, they'll show up and they'll, they'll do the, they'll do the, you know, they'll look at the apartment and they'll say they want it and the landlord to their face says, okay, it's yours. When I get back to the office, I'll send you the information and no information ever comes and then the family drives by it a week later and someone else is in the apartment because uh, there's discrimination and I understand from I, 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 I can understand from all aspects how frustrating it is but the landlords obviously also have rights and there's all and that's where I think it has to come from either beyond this Commission because there's federal obviously regulations and there's federal rights for both the landlords and the tenants and so that's where my whole talk my whole we found out here um, so I've been doing I've been here for almost 10 years so I started as a parent educator working directly with families um, and I actually still work directly with families I have a very very small caseload so that I can stay close to the work and our answer to what was going on was that our families were were sharing with us that they didn't know what they didn't know and so we really we really started putting kind of our um, our emphasis and our work into educating our families on what their rights actually were. And so when, like I said, when we have a family who moves into a new place, we're sitting down with that family, we're making sure that family goes through the inspection, we're making sure they, do a, they, they don't just get a real quick five minute inspection, we're making sure that they're documenting when things are wrong and things like that. And then we are, we've actually been very successful, not through the city, but through the, the um, tenant uh, resource center out of Milwaukee. We've actually been very successful for them. We have had landlords who have um, definitely had, have definitely evicted families after we've stepped in. 
Um, but I will tell you that we had a situation with a landlord a couple of months ago, and when he didn't know what he didn't know, and when he learned the story of what I could share of the family, his relationship with that family changed overnight. And he actually saw that family as human, and he saw that family as really trying, he, he thought what he was seeing, what he realized was what he was seeing was what his own story was, not what the actual family story was. So my mom was a, was a um, my mom ran Meadowview East, which is that large apartment mm -hmm. complex over off of um, uh, University. And my mom, when she started there, um, she she was there for almost 15 years. Unfortunately, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, so she had to walk away. But she started there 15 years ago and when it was really a bad situation there was um, lots of police calls lots of really horrible things going on and the way that um, she fixed that was really just started talking to people and started talking to the tenants and started talking to um, and learning people's stories and I think that that as as nabby pamby as it might sound I think that's where that um, oppression can thrive on misunderstanding and alienation and so my recommendation would be to have more of those landlord um, education opportunities where landlords can hear from um, the nonprofits and not and also the, the families, but also the nonprofits working directly with these families. And as I said, Tara, when I met her at Management Women, um, you've got to meet people where they're at when you want people to start coming to these. So when you get to that point where you're ready to, where, and I know it's public now, but when you really start your push to get to hear the actual people that are going through these issues, you want to be able to meet them where they're at. And so having it in locations where families are at. And so a lot of our work is done at Navarino Park because that's where families go in the summertime. And so a lot of times we will hold, um, that's how we get in touch with our families that we bring the services to our families rather than the services or rather than expecting the families to come to the services so they spoke very eloquently um passionately and so i i don't want to take up your time and just repeat what they said um but i think the other issue and and i a, a unique solution and i know this is being talked about with jbs is I'm a military brat, so I lived on military bases my whole childhood, and um, the military kind of has it right. They put everybody on base, and you live in, in the big complexes, and that your rent is taken care of, and how beautiful that could be if we could have these beautiful complexes where JBS, Schreiber, all of these different um, businesses would um, take care of these complexes, and so people could live in almost that village mentality, because I, uh, my dad was a pretty high rank, and yet we lived right next to the, and this is military talk, I don't know how many of you know military talk, but the CW3 family lived right next to the E1 family. And E1 obviously makes a whole lot less, mo less money than the CW3 family, but we lived together and we lived literally in harmony and we took care of one another. And so looking at like that concept of that, com not communal housing, but that that um, company almost sponsored housing where everyone can live in not the slums but beautiful apartment complexes where everyone can live together and be successful. So that's my plug. So, thank you. So I have yeah. a question. I, I just want to thank you for hosting us. Oh, absolutely. And um, you know, for the conversation, this has been great. Um, can you tell me more about the Tenant Resource Center in Milwaukee, like, and and how you engage with them, and what exactly they do? Yeah, so you've got a, so you've got fair. There's Fair Housing Wisconsin, right? So that's your like large like. The Tenant Resource Center is more, and it's kind of what you're kind of describing. Is it's less about their. They're not necessarily taking actions, they're more just answering questions for us. So a good example of that would be when, um, when, when Saeed uh, mentioned that there's families that when their lease is up, they're being asked to leave. The reality is, is if you call the Tenant Resource Center and you say I have a family and their lease is up and they were told that they had to leave, the Tenant Resource Center is going to tell you that's within their rights and that's not your monkey you want to take on because you're not going to win, right? And so, but the Tenant Resource Center can also tell you, um, we, had a, we have a family who was evicted in the midst of the worst cold snap we had this year. And by law, in the lease, they couldn't be evicted because there's this part of the lease that says, we can't kick you out during these winter months. 
And so the Tenant Resource Center was able to help us with that and tell us, yep, that's right, if it's in the lease, they have to follow the lease, obviously. The got you is, is that's not in everybody's lease. And so that's where that education comes in. And maybe that's where that, 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 that opportunity could come in to inform the landlords about the issues our families face so that leases look similar across the board, right? Landlords have the right to raise rent. I mean, they, that is with well within their right. But at the same time, the Tenant Resource Center can help us. We had another situation similar to where uh, they raise their rent within their lease. They can't do that. They, now, they can if it's bought out. That is true. Unfortunately, that was what we were told. Um, if someone else comes in and buys the apartment, unfortunately, they can raise the, the rent. But the Tenant Resource Center set was able to tell us that, yep, that is a fight you want to take on. They definitely cannot do that. They can't raise the rent. So that's what we use the Tenant Resource Center for. We've admittedly never used the city. How did, how did, you, how did you know about the Tenant Resource Center? Yeah. How, did, how would people find out about it? Yeah, so from a nonprofit perspective, we're trying to give every resource we can for our families. So my in our specific case here at the Howe Community Resource Center, we do the research. We look at all the issues our families need, and we, we seek out collaborations, we seek out um, opportunities to learn more about the different resources. You can, I mean, anybody could Google it, um, but also it's really about just kind of st keeping your finger on the pulse and knowing what's out there. As a nonprofit, especially a small nonprofit like this one, we have the ability to do that. So that's how we found out about it. Right, so, so for individuals, they would pretty much have to call two one one. Be connected to yeah, an organization you'd have to be connected to an organization, yeah. which actually brings up a really great point, and that's actually why like our hygiene hub started because we were finding out, and that's a whole different issue, but we were finding out that unless individuals were connected to a resource, they weren't able to get these needs met. And so by making it accessible to all Green, Brown County School social workers, we knew we could hit all the kids that we needed to hit because everybody goes to school, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, that could also be maybe a campaign of letting the families know and letting the community know that this exists because it's funded, it's paid for, it's a part of the, 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 the resources. But if you don't know, you don't know. Right, so I mean... So, Imagine having something on the city website that made a big point of saying, hey, Absolutely. if you're looking for resources as a tenant, I mean, I get that landlords have rights, but it, but it seems to me that everything coming from the city is more geared toward landlords. I mean, they're... 100%. Right? Mm -hmm. so, and so how do we gear things toward tenants so they know it? about it? And then, yeah. you know, like, uh, I mean, I don't know, like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, you know, ways that we could, some creative ways we could think about this, but, you know, imagine you know, Kamza making sure that when somebody signs a lease, there's like a one pager that says, hey, these are all the resources that you have Absolutely. if you want to find out like what's actually legal and what's and not. And that's, you know? what, that's what it meant on the education side. Yeah, yeah. Because tenants don't know if they don't know. And so also putting it on city buses, putting it out there in places where people yeah. are, your laundry mats, your libraries, mm -hmm. finding those, identifying those places where our families are congregating and where our families are spending their time and putting the information there. Mm -hmm. um, working with um, other nonprofits, We All Rise, right down the street, um, all of the different nonprofits that have access because the, there's what, 900, I think at last count, there's 904 nonprofits in Brown County. And our, our mission, our goals are all the same, a stronger community. And so everybody's doing the work in a different way and getting access to all of those other nonprofits and, find, and getting access to those families. And again, meeting those. The best thing you can do as a commission, I, per, I, I really feel like, is having your meetings at a nonprofit each and every time. Because you'll get families to come. You'll get families to come. This is their safe space. And they will come if you come to their safe space. They're not going to come if you have it in an area where it's not safe for them. And it's not physical safe. It's more mentally and emotionally safe. Well, who do they trust? They trust us here. So if you had it here and you asked families to come in, they would come because they trust us. And that is what your nonprofits, that's where you can rely on your nonprofits to find your families to inform these decisions. Because we can stand up here till we're blue in the face and tell you what we think, but they are ultimately going to be the experts in their own lives. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah.
Well, tonight was really insightful. I mean, we only had three organizations, but I learned a lot. Oh, yeah. Um, kind of sounds like some of the resources we have available right now aren't really um, known. So that is really low-hanging fruit, like you were saying. Um, but, yeah, um, tonight was just informational. Um, I don't think we have anything else on this on the agenda. Um, when is our next meeting scheduled for? Um, do we have one scheduled? We not scheduled. don't have <laughs> one scheduled. Um, but I believe we did jot down the best days and times. Um, I think we kind of voted on Mondays for... Does that work for you guys, Monday? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So um, my thought would be, because I thought you said, Tara, that the first Monday doesn't work well. Yep, first Mondays are the EDA meetings. And then, sorry, unfortunately, the third every third Monday is our um, racial equity ad hoc mm-hmm. county. So maybe we can shoot for the second Monday of every month? Yes, second Monday is yes. work for me. So I think what I'll do is I'll send out the schedule to everyone to say is mm-hmm. what we're, we're thinking that I wouldn't have any glaring issues with it and go from there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sounds okay. good. Sheriff, did you have any? Can I just, I just wanted yeah. to inform the committee, I guess, because this had come up a couple of times that the Brown County Housing Authority actually has a subcommittee form mm-hmm. for the specific purpose of looking at the relationship between the housing choice and the voucher program and the landlords okay. use of it. So we have a landlord, and, and it all came out of when the city um, passed the Equal Rights um, Amendment. Remember, they pulled yeah. out the, yeah. um, the rental income as a um, non-discrimination clause. So it, it kind of came as a result of that. So we have actually some apartment association people that are on that committee, which is good, because that's we need to convince landlords to take the vouchers, because we have a lot of vouchers in Brown County. What, and what's, that the, is a big sorry, what's the name of that committee? It's... Um, it's the Brown County Housing Authority Housing Subcommittee, I think they're calling it. Okay, thanks. Um, Patrick Leifger is the executive director of the Brown County Housing Authority. So um, we're meeting tomorrow actually on it. They've done surveys with landlords. They're trying to figure out why aren't you using the program. It's guaranteed rent. I mean, it's a good thing for a landlord to use that program. So they're trying to do some education on that. They're going to go to the apartment association. As much as they don't want to do that, they're going to go. Right, because that's usually not a good situation. They're going to go there and kind of talk about the program, and we're going to we're looking at ways to change the program to make it more um, appealing to landlords to use, whether that's security deposit guarantees or something like that. So we're trying to entice landlords to use that program more. But so that's in the works right now. Thank you for sharing that. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. All right, well, um, if any, no one else has anything more to add to this session, then we can adjourn it. Um, we don't have more, but we don't need to. <laughs> so, well, thank you so much, Cheryl, for joining us today. I really appreciate it. I'm glad that you came and heard um, from the organizations themselves. Um, and thank you, commissioners and um, Joe and Raya, for coming today. This is really That's insightful. So we will discuss. We'll um, get together and discuss um, how to move forward for the, the next one. I believe the next one, Cheryl, we wanted to invite the public and the members who are actually experiencing things to come and speak. Um, so we'll discuss that, and then we'll also extend the invitation once we figure that out.